Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Yang Tang. I'm a maintainer of CoreDNS project. In today's talk, I'm going to mostly focus on the introduction and deep dive of CoreDNS project. This is my profile and my GitHub page. By the way, if anyone has any questions you want to ask, you can always reach me uh, at GitHub with my GitHub handle, Yang Tang. Uh, so I, I should be available most of the time on GitHub. Okay, so this is the uh, agenda for today's talk. So first of all, I'm going to introduce about the uh, CoreDNS project and it's, uh, some of its history and uh, its functionalities. Uh, I'm also going to share the status update since last year. Uh, uh, next, it's going to be the discussion of uh, Google Summer of Code environment, uh, which is one of the highlight of CoreDNS. Uh, at the end, I'm going to discuss about technical deep dive of CoreDNS. I'm also going to share a demo plugin, I'm going to show you a demo, how to write a CoreDNS plugin in, let's say, 50 lines of code. Hopefully, anyone that's interested in writing a CoreDNS plugin can learn something and uh, contributing from now on. Uh, okay, first of all, CoreDNS. So what is CoreDNS? Uh, I guess most of people in this room already heard of CoreDNS as part of the project. CoreDNS is a flexible DNS server written in Go. It has a focus on service discovery. The, one of the nice features of CoreDNS is it's a plugin based architecture, which means you could easily extend the additional functionalities if you, are, if you know how to write in Go. In other words, if you see any functionality that's missing and you know how to write Go, you can just uh, uh, grab your laptop and write a, several lines of code. Hopefully, you can come up with something that's going to be useful for you. Uh, CoreDNS is a default DNS server in Kubernetes now. We have been, we have been part of DNS release since uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, 1.11, and in 1.13, we became the default DNS server. Uh, CoreDNS itself uh, support a different uh, protocols. We have support for DNS, DNS over TCP, t over TOS, and DNS over gRPC. Uh, in addition to integration with uh, Kubernetes, CoreDNS also has a raw 33 DNS data sync up. So if you deploy your CoreDNS in a Kubernetes cluster, you can actually wire up CoreDNS uh, with the raw 33 AWS backend. In this way, for any uh, raw 33 change in AWS, it can be populated to your Kubernetes cluster. This allows uh, easy integration of uh, uh, your on-prem de deployment with your uh, cloud deployment and also allow a mixture of uh, hybrid cloud deployment. Uh, CoreDNS itself is started and uh, led by Mick Chibben. He, uh, when CoreDNS started, he used to work for Google, but now he works for another company. Uh, actually, one interesting thing about CoreDNS is that uh, when Mick started CoreDNS project, he actually uh, for the source code from Caddy HTTP. I mean, I'm not sure anyone heard of Caddy HTTP server before. Raise your hand. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, as you may know, Caddy HTTP is a HTTP server with a focus on HTTP two. And uh, Mika actually grabbed the uh, Caddy source code and uh, forked the source code. And even though Caddy has nothing to do with DNS. He somehow managed to make that happen to just change the source code so that it became a DNS server. So that's one interesting thing. That's also one of the good things about the Golang by itself because CoreDNS is written in Golang. And with Golang, a lot of things are so easily uh, uh, programmed such that if you want to make any change, it's so convenient. So that's just some of the interesting trivia about the CoreDNS project. Uh, I want to discuss about the CoreDNS community. I mean, CoreDNS, compared with some other projects like Kubernetes, CoreDNS has a relatively small community. However, our community is uh, uh, expanding, uh, and we're, we have a HLC 150 plus contributors at the moment. We have 14 maintainers, 
Uh, one thing about the core DNS maintainers is that uh, uh, most of the maintainers by core DNS are actually uh, not uh, sponsored by a company. So we spend our time in our we spend our spare time to contribute to core DNS. So that's a uh, that's a distinction uh, between core DNS and other project in CNCF. Uh, we also have the thirty public adopters. Adopter means if a company or an institution use core DNS and they want to share us with their name and make their name public, they can announce them as uh, adopters. So of course we have much more users or much more company using core DNS because of the core integration. But so far we have 30 adopters that uh, they, they, they allow us to use their name. So that's a good thing. And uh, also we have uh, 4,000 plus stars. That's, uh, no, in GitHub that's probably the only thing that matters. <laughs> By the way, if, uh, if anyone uh, feel like the core DNS itself is helpful and you want to help core DNS, uh, as well, you, if you haven't done so, you can certainly push a start button on GitHub. Uh, with respect to CoreDNS community, uh, the most active one obviously is GitHub. Uh, me and me are available on GitHub most of the time. If you have any question, you can always ask questions on GitHub. Uh, we are glad to solve the issue. We also have Slack channel as part of the uh, CNCF with uh, CoreDNS Slack channel. This one is less popular, mostly because uh, nowadays you have a lot of uh, ways to do the messaging. So people use like a WeChat here, like in, in the United States, people may use Gitter, may use Slack. So I cannot say you will find a lot of help from Slack, but that's also, it's one of the active channels that you can utilize if you want help. We have some other resources, but I'm not sure uh, it's going to be very active at the moment. <laughs> uh, since 2017, Cordina has participated with uh, uh, Google Summer Code program. That's a program sponsored by Google. Essentially, Google, for any student that hasn't graduated, uh, if you are still registered in school, you can participate in Google Summer Code. Essentially, uh, you'll complete a project in several months and Google will pay you money during that period. So that's a nice return for both for you and for the community. We, uh, as part of CNCF project, Claudine has uh, participated in uh, Google Summer Code three years in a row. Uh, the first year that that's, uh, we have uh, contributors contributing to DNS tab. The second year, we have contributors that's actually have an integration of ETCD. And this year, we have proposal accepted. I'm not going to announce his name yet because he hasn't finished the Google Summer Code. So, so next year, I'm going to show his name here. Uh, by the way, if anyone, uh, know, uh, if anyone in this room knows anyone else that has an interest in participating in Google Summer Code, you can certainly apply that next year. And that's, like I said, that's a nice return for, your, for yourself if you're a student because Google pays you money. It's also a, a good environment for you to be participating in the community. So I'm going to start with uh, technical di deep dive here. The first thing I'm going to discuss is uh, server discovery with DNS. Then I'll update some of the uh, Kubernetes use cases because obviously core DNS uh, uh, itself gets a lot of popularity, popularity because of the Kubernetes integration. Uh, I'm going to show how query are resolved. And finally, I'm going to give you a demo to just, uh, just see how you can build a core DNS plugin in, let's say, 50 line of code. Uh, let's see. So first of all, survey discovery. As we all know, core DNS has a focus on survey discovery. So uh, a lot of people actually ask the question, in this day and age with uh, software-defined networks, everything could be virtual. You have IP, your IP, you can assign IP, any IP you like uh, in a virtual way if you deploy your networking. Uh, so why DNS is still an option or why DNS still could be useful nowadays? So there are several reasons for you to use DNS, even though SDN can solve most of the problem. So first of all, DNS is a very nice and flexible in direction. 
with this interaction, it allows you to uh, to stay away from future changes. For example, let's say you want to migrate from one cloud to another, and your servers may be forced to have IP address change. You don't want to uh, disrupt your user experience because you you don't want to tell every user say I'm going to make a change because I move from let's say AWS to uh, Ali Cloud or from AWS to Google Cloud. Uh, in this way, if uh, if you have DNS uh, as an indirection, you tell the customer say you continue to use the same DNS uh, name and uh, we'll do the backend change so nothing will be impacted. So that's the indirection you always want because you never know what's going to happen in the next uh, next year or next 10 years, right? 10 years is probably too long, but even for next year, you could have lots of change for your service. Another thing is the DNS itself is very easy and simple. Uh, this is a protocol that has been there for so long, such as uh, dev developers, DevOps, and IT admins, both uh, all of them knows. So this is very important because you could introduce a new concept like SDN, but not everyone knows what SDN is. So with DNS, you can do a lot of things and talk to different levels and different communities. And this is very important for you when you try to deploy your service. Uh, and also DNS has been, has been it's a very uh, stable and old protocol, which means it's very, uh, it has been there for a long time with your I, existing IT infrastructure. So your IT infrastructure may not be so advanced to know how to set up SDN, but they certainly know how to set up DNS. I'm pretty sure about that. So that's why you want to choose this protocol if you have a chance. Uh, also with DNS, you could work with a hybrid environment. Like I mentioned, we have some integration of uh, uh, Route 53 uh, Cloud Sync up with AWS. So that means if you deploy something on AWS, and you have another Kubernetes cluster, the information on both of them can be synced up and they can share each other so that you can see where the service endpoint is. And finally, and most importantly, DNS itself is a distributed system in nature. It may not be the most sophisticated di distributed system, but it still scales well. So if we have a very big uh, system that has like a thousand of nodes or even hundreds of nodes with DNS, you can easily scale up. That's not something so easy. That's not something you can achieve with other solutions. Uh, let's go to the next uh, next topic about the uh, update for Kubernetes. Core DNS itself uh, is part of the Kubernetes release, so. Anything related to core DNS might impact Kubernetes as well. We are here for KubeCon, so I'm going to discuss about some of the changes that have an impact. So first of all, in Kubernetes uh, 1.11 to 1.14, uh, we use core DNS 1.2.6. There are some, uh, unfortunately, there are some incompatible changes uh, of core DNS which may impact things. For example, in 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 core DNS 1.2.6, uh, 1.5, the health plugin itself has been uh, replaced with health and ready. Uh, gRPC plugin has been introduced. Uh, also, there are some other changes. For example, the multiple API server endpoint no longer supported. Uh, you can still, if you, are, if you have a core DNS, uh, talk to Kubernetes, and your D core DNS is not part of Kubernetes cluster, you can still point. You can still talk to Kubernetes, but it's not the, uh, you cannot talk to multiple API, uh, API servers anymore. And also the API server resync has been disabled. This is uh, quite uh, debatable, but the decision is that we want to move forward with uh, disabled API server resync. Uh, uh, just for your convenience, that's a backward incompatible change. So if you are going to update to Core DNS 1.5.0. Uh, you need to take notice of those uh, changes that uh, may impact your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, okay. So, uh, let, me, let me see. So this is a diagram that shows how uh, Core DNS resolve query. So first of all, Core DNS uh, for for each query, it's always based on the 
uh, the root of your query domains. Uh, in this way, uh, here you can see uh, different domain names have different uh, plugins enabled, like for organization.com, you have arrows, cache, and forward domain, forward plugin enabled. For, by default, you have a much larger list of plugins enabled, like arrows, chaos, Kubernetes, uh, and also forward. Uh, when query comes in, first it's going to find out the, the suffix domain that's going to, to see if it's a match. If it is a match, it's going to uh, go through each plugin and, and traverse through the plugins one by one until one plugin decides this plugin is going to do the job. If this plugin do the job, it's going to return back, give you the query, and uh, the, the process will stop. If the plugin uh, uh, capture the query, and this plugin cannot figure out if it's need to process or not, then this plugin will essentially let the query to uh, follow through, fall through to the next plugin. So next plugin will pick up the query and decide if they want to return or not. So that's the uh, workflow of resolving a query in Cordinas. Okay, now let's uh, Let's get to the point of the demo. You know, everyone probably want to see some true demos <laughs> nowadays. So the demo plugin is a very simple thing. It's essentially a source IP based service discovery. We talk about uh, service discovery. We talk about coordinates. So, so what exactly is service discovery? Service discovery essentially is a way to resolve an endpoint to uh, to IP address, uh, but if you say I have a service and, and I know this IP is a static, so that's not the point. Because uh, if it's one to one match, what's the point of having a, having a map by itself? So here I'm going to show you why service discovery could have uh, complications. Let's say you have a, a cluster, and your cluster uh, has internal IPs and external IPs. Of course, when when some of the uh, node try to contact your service, it might be outside of the cluster, it might be also inside the cluster. If it's outside of cluster, it might contact the endpoint that's actually going to the public IP. If your node is inside the cluster itself, you probably want to assign a private IP. So in this case, as you can see, let's say you have a cluster with a private IP of uh, 172.0.0/8, which is very common if you ever played with Kubernetes. Uh, let's just do it this way. Let's say from outside. Uh, if a query is from outside, uh, and your query example.org, let's say for some testing purpose, we're just going to return your uh, IP of 8.8.8.org. Uh, it may carry some meanings, but it's probably relevant. Uh, let's say internally, if uh, if a node try to query the DNS uh, with a record of example.org, it's going to return a different IP address. Let's just assume it's 1.1.1.1. So that's the uh, setup we want to demo in uh, in this demo plugin. And by the way, the 8.8.8.org. That's the DNS server provider Google, and 1.1.1.1 is a DNS server provided by Cloudflare. They have different uh, uh, purpose and different strengths. I'm not going to discuss about which DNS server is a good one, so it's up to you to decide. Uh, so let's, let's just go to the source code directly. So I'm going to walk through the source code so you could take a look and see how easy it is to write a core DNS plugin. So before you, you want to uh, uh, write a plugin, so first thing is you need to initialize, you need to set up your plugin. To set up plugin is fairly easy. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is an init function that's actually in Golang. Essentially, it's going to just bring this, plugin, uh, uh, bring this plugin up. You register yourself, which is a demo, and then you register uh, action, which is setup. The setup is it's actually doing almost nothing except it just acknowledge that this setup, uh, this setup uh, captures the content of the core file, say, 
I'm going to be responsible for a demo plugin. So that's fairly straightforward, right? So now the, <coughs> let's get to the server DNS. The server DNS is a main body of a plugin. With server DNS, you have uh, you essentially implement this function uh, to to decide what you're going to do with the DNS query. As we can see here, uh, server DNS pass a DNS response writer. It also pass a message. So R is the DNS message that's a query message that you need to take a look and see what you, you want to do. Response writer is uh, it's up to you to decide if you want to just return back to give them uh, give the query uh, the response, or you want to let the uh, plugin to want to let let the plugin process to fall through to the next plugin. Uh, the first line, as you can see, is just uh, to try to uh, state equals uh, request uh, dot request. This is just essentially just uh, allow you to capture the state of the request. Uh, you get a queue name. That's uh, that's a query name, and you can decide if you want to reply uh, IP address. As we discussed here, you want to reply different IP address based on where the query comes from. If the query is coming from a private IP address, let's say 172, which means it's actually internal, or if a query is from IP address of 127, which means which actually means it's actually local query, we are going to return 1.1.1.1. Otherwise, we are going to return an IP address of 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Uh, the next line, as you can see, it is a print printout. This printout is uh, it's unnecessary, but for the demo purpose, we want to just print out something so you can see what's happening, right? Uh, so let's continue. So we we get the first part process. The second part is essentially you can decide what you want to reply. Uh, now you need to construct a DNS uh, packet, reply packet, the packet. Essentially, it's just you have a resource record of header with uh, type A, and the class is an inet type. Uh, you, you, as we discussed, uh, we have different IP address to, to be returned. So we just uh, take the IP address and uh, inject that into the response packet of a DNS, and uh, we decide to return. That's, uh, that's actually pretty much it for for a plugin. Uh, as if anyone has ever played with core DNS, you probably know in order to set up core DNS, you also need a core file. A core file itself is also very straightforward. As you can see, uh, by default, all plugins are disabled. If you want to enable any plugin, you just write the line. In our case, we have a demo, we just enable demo, and that's it. So we don't want to have any other uh, configurations. Of course, if you have uh, interest, you can dig deep into this, uh, uh, dig deep into the core file setup and see how play with the uh, core DNS plugin. Uh, the next step, as we as we mentioned, we already have everything ready. The next step, of course, is how to build that. We have a source code of um, uh, setup. We have source code of self DNS. We have a core file. Now the next step is to build a core DNS. To build a core DNS is also very fairly easy. You add a demo colon demo to plugin.config. This is all you need to, to enable everything. The next step is to compile. In order to help everyone and make the process convenient, we, there is one way to, to build a plugin that that is to reuse the Docker. I mean, I, I've been with the Docker community for a long time, so I'm certainly more familiar with this concept. If you want to build a, of course, you can, you can build your core DNS uh, in a Golang environment, but in case you don't want to install Golang, or in case your Golang environment has some setup you are not, you are not feeling comfortable to mess up with, you can just install <coughs> Docker. And as long as you have a Docker installed on your machine, all you need is just one line to compile that. See, if you look at this line, this line essentially just uh, uh, grabs the Golang's 1.12 uh, Docker, uh, Docker image. And this allows you to run uh, 
command line inside the Golang. And in our case, we are going to use uh, make gen, which is going to generate the necessary, uh, generate additional files that's required to build a plugin. And the next step is make, which is going to uh, give you the binary. And that should be it. If you run uh, a core DNS from your command line, that's all you need. So I'm going to uh, escape the the PowerPoint slide and show you the demo. So just to make it simple, I already set up a file here. As you can see, the uh, one file is a plugin.config, which is uh, essentially just one line change, right? That's fairly easy. Another thing is, uh, that's, uh, let's just add everything so we can see which file has been changed. Only add two files, right? The first file is uh, setup.go. If you look into this one, yeah, that's straightforward, right? So how, how many lines? That's only 20, 20 lines, right? So that, that's that's all you need to set up the setup and register demo plugin. So next file, let's take a look. Okay, this is uh, slightly, uh, slightly more than several lines, but as you can see, it's still pretty much straightforward. We have a self DNS, which is the main body of your process. The logic is uh, quite clear, right? As I mentioned, uh, by default, we are going to return 8.8.8.8. But if it's an internal IP, it's from an internal IP, from a private IP, then we are going to say, okay, let's just return a different uh, a uh, different IP address that's going to be 1.1.1.1. .1 so that should be it. So let's just uh, uh, let's just run this command. Let's see how how we could build everything. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually building. So uh, let's just wait probably like one minute to, to wait until the binary has been built. And then I'm going to show you uh, use dig to see how to query that from internal and external interface and see how different, uh, uh, different IP addresses are being re replied. I already opened a two window here. One window is actually part of the machine. This one has, is on the same machine as the machine I'm building. So you could consider this one as an internal, uh, internal node. And uh, I have another machine, I have another window that's actually to my laptop. Of course, this one is uh, external, right? So ideally, if I'm, uh, if I'm going to set everything up, uh, I, we should be able to see different result if we do the query. Okay, yeah, almost there. It's it's going to take some time, but I think uh, we're almost there. Okay, now let's see. We have a binary file which is uh, coding as it's already. Uh, the binary has already been generated. We need a core file, which is just a one line, right? Okay, let's actually just remove the one line. Okay, that's uh, pretty good. It's up and running. Uh, let's just go into the same machine. Let's just do a dig. By the way, since uh, I set the 
whole number to be 1053, so I'm going to use a minus P to talk to a different poor number. Because the default poor number is actually occupied by your system. But that should be easily configurable if you're, if, if you're in a true production environment. Let's just... Uh, OK, as you can see, that's uh, because it's internal, so that's going to be 1.1.1.1, 1 .1 .1 .1, right? I'm actually pointing to 172, which is a private IP address. Now let's get to my local machine. My local machine that's actually outside of this cluster, right? So I'm going to dig with a different IP address. Let me see which one. <coughs> See, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a result we expect. Because uh, I'm actually querying the, the DNS from my laptop. My laptop is not a part of the build server that's uh, running on the left side. So you see that's 8.8.8. .8 that actually gives you the idea of how to build a, a plugin. And you can see everything has uh, uh, pretty much packed into like two files with like a fifth line of code. That's all you need for having a, to write a plugin. Uh, okay, so the last, uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, if I already showed how to write a plugin, so if you have interest to, to contribute, of course, we will come any contributions. Uh, you have several ways to help coding as you can start on coding as in GitHub. Uh, if the company you work for or the institution you work for uh, use the as and you're willing to share your name, you can certainly add the name to adopter.md. This is also a way to open your first uh, pull request and become a contributor. Uh, you can also participate in uh, GitHub or Slack discussions. And finally, uh, if you have an interest, you want to, to, to be a maintainer, uh, actually if you are a maintainer of coding as you're also a CNCF maintainer, so that's, uh, it's just kind of like a badge. Give you some nice, uh, uh, nice fame if you if you are interested in that. So the way to become a maintainer, the the barrier is pretty low. If you can complete a pull request with uh, with a significant content, of course, if it's just a typo, that's not going to count as a maintainer. But if you can add a functionality, that's going to be significant. And there's just one pull request. That's all you need. If you can find an um, existing maintainer to sponsor you to be a maintainer, then you're part of the core DNS maintainer community and also your CNCF maintainer now, which is a very nice thing for everyone. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for today's talk. I just wonder, any questions? Anyone want to ask, discuss? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which one? So, so, sorry. Wait. Wait. Uh, you mentioned that there is no longer need a upstream. Yeah. Is that replaced by the plugin plug ma mechanism? Uh, I think this is handled automatically. Uh, unfortunately, this part is uh, I'm not uh, very familiar with uh, with the way the upstream works. But if you have some question, I think you can open the issue in GitHub. Uh, if I, I think I can find someone to answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any any other questions? Yeah. Sure. Uh, one question: Does the uh, coding support the dust dust app? Uh, can you can you can you repeat the question again? Uh, does Cordian support a uh, uh, dual stack? Oh, dual stack. Sorry. Oh, you mean dual stack uh, yeah, yeah, IPv4, yeah. Uh, yeah. a combination of IPv4 and IPv6, right? I think yeah, that's yeah. the question, right? Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting question. I believe it should, but no one tested that before. But you can open an issue. If it doesn't support, I'll try to make sure it works. <laughs> yes. OK, uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, yeah, sure. I know in the past uh, there is a code uh, Kuba DNS. Why, what's the 
Uh, okay, we are almost running out of time, but I can quickly just uh, explain a little bit. Uh, KubeDNS was uh, was part of uh, Kubernetes at one point, and uh, it's actually just a combination of uh, different uh, software. This uh, Kube, uh, it's actually just a uh, uh, small script with uh, DNS MSQ, which is a DNS server written by C, and this is another container. So in order to deploy KubeDNS, you need to have three containers. In core DNS, they actually combine that into one. Uh, at one point, uh, actually it's, uh, it's a collaboration uh, between core DNS team and, uh, and the Google and the Red Hat and the uh, Kubernetes team. So we collectively decide that core DNS probably is a, uh, is a solution moving forward. So we essentially just say, okay, let's uh, introduce core DNS as a default DNS server and let's deprecate uh, Kube DNS. So the Kube DNS will be deprecated pretty soon. Uh, any any other questions? Oh, okay. One more question. Uh, I run Kubernetes in some offline environment, and um, then I can uh, I cannot connect to uh, upstream DNS server. Uh, so uh, how can I config uh, Kubernetes upstream? I configure a core DNS upstream. Uh, the upstream. Uh, when when I just uh, I cannot uh, connect to outside the DNS server. Yeah. Uh, then I uh, configure query DNS query field uh, upstream. Uh, then uh, you mean up, upstream. Uh, 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 I configure upstream. Just upstream. Uh, upstream or config, uh, I cannot, uh, uh, just, uh, I run query DNS, then, and, and report me an error, uh, loop, de loop de detected, and, and the query DNS cannot start, start up. Uh, I can only say I'm not so, so sure about your question, but if you can, I think you encounter issue when you config the upstream uh, with core DNS. I think if that's the case, maybe I, I would encourage you to open an issue uh, in GitHub so I can I can take a look because uh, not you know it's it's hard to give you answer with all the all the context at the moment. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, uh, if you have any questions. You can always uh, open an issue on GitHub. Uh, both me and uh, Mick probably should be available most of the time. So yeah, hopefully that can help solve some of the issues you guys encounter. Okay, okay I think uh, I think that's it. Thanks everyone for coming here. Uh, have a wonderful day and enjoy your stay. <laughs>